Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 76 with John and David from the Debt Free Guys. It's time for a new American dream, one that doesn't involve working in a cubicle for 40 years, barely scraping by. Whether you're looking to get your financial house in order, invest the money you already have, or discover new paths for wealth creation, you're in the right place. This show is for anyone who has money or wants more. This is the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. How's it going, everybody? I'm Scott Trench, and I'm here with my co-host, Miss Mindy Jensen. How are you doing today, Mindy? Scott, I am having a really great day. How are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. I uh, love today's episode uh, with with John and David. They've had they have an incredible debt reduction and elimination approach story, and then they've gone on from there to create a life of financial abundance. Business owners, you know, financial independent retire entrepreneurs. Right? <laughs> that was a great term that they that they've coined there. Um, and really just an all around great show about kind of starting at rock bottom or at least, you know, in a, in a big pile of debt, climbing the way out and getting to freedom. Yeah. You know, I really like, they had a, uh, a series of four or five, uh, ways to get yourself out of debt and how to become, uh, debt free and money abundant. And number one, spend less than you make like groundbreaking stuff here, be money conscious, live by a budget. Um, you know, it's, it, what I love about their story is that it's the same as everybody else's story. There's no secret sauce to this. You have to do the work. And here's the things that it takes to get debt free. Here's the things that it takes to become financially independent. And, you know, they just lay it out really, really easily and really understandably this is what you need to do. If you don't do this, it's not going to happen. Yeah. I, I think there's also a component of backing into the, they have a clear goal and vision for their lives and they backed into that. And that has created a different um, financial situation that they've produced for themselves, a large cash position, um, 401k, a, a very large 401k balance, business ownership. That's just different from maybe somebody else who's kind of going into that, you know, 25 times my annual expenses through index funds and a couple of rental properties, you know, uh, portfolio. And I think the reasons why they did that is are very intelligent as well. Yeah. They didn't start off this journey to stop working. Mm -hmm. They started off this journey to stop working for other people. Yep. To stop working at jobs that they didn't like. And you know, that while one of the most common things I hear about the financial independence journey is, oh, I want to quit my job. Well, you probably want to quit your job because you don't like it. You would probably really enjoy doing work that you enjoyed. It's not that you don't want to work and be productive anymore. It's that you don't want to work in this soul sucking place and have all of your free time, you know, just sucked away from you because you have to trade your time for money. Yep. I mean, and the consequence of not of the consequence of spending more than you earn or not spending significantly less than you earn is that when you are stuck in that dead end job, which will happen, you know, at, at, with greater probability every passing year uh, that goes on, you will not have the option to make those big changes in, in your life. Right? Yep. And, and that's, that's a good word. That's truly what financial independence is all about. Giving yourself options. Yep. Absolutely. Well, should we bring in um, David and John? Yep. John and David from the Debt Free Guys, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. How are you guys doing today? Hi, we're great. Awesome. Thank you for having us. Yes, definitely. Thank you. We're happy oh, to be here. <laughs> I'm so glad this could finally work out. I have known John and David forever, and it's just never synced. And now we're we're finally getting you on the show, and I'm very, very excited. So yeah, exactly. like we start off with most of our shows, we want to know where your journey with money begins. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, our, I, I think our first uh, awareness with money really begins after John and I had been together for a year and a half. Uh, we decided one weekend to go up to the mountains in Colorado uh, and visit a friend of John's. He lived in Winter Park with his girlfriend. Uh, and we went up there, had a great weekend, although we both had been to Winter Park before. For some reason, we just fell in love with Winter Park that time and decided this would be a great place for us to have a vacation home. So <laughs> on the way out of town on Sunday, we stopped at a realtor's office. We looked at real estate. We get in the car. We're starting to have this really fun fantasy conversation about buying land and building a house. I love modern architecture. I want to build a modern home. So we had this fantasy conversation. If you're familiar with the area, Winter Park has an elevation of about 9,100 feet. 
So we crest over the top of the mountain. We're driving down towards Denver. Our conversation still continues, and pretty soon we're in Estes Park, elevation 7,500 feet. And our conversation had changed a little bit. We were now talking about, well, maybe, you, maybe it would make more sense if we just bought a place that already was up there. That would be a good first step, right? Let's, let's do that. Continue talking, continue driving. Pretty soon we're in Boulder, elevation 5,400 feet. Conversation is now more along the lines of, maybe we should do a long-term rental. You know, we could probably do that. Like we'll rent for a whole month in the wintertime and a whole month in the summertime and all that kind of thing. Pretty soon we're in Denver, elevation 5,280 feet. It's the Mile High City and our conversation was no longer a mile high. <laughs> <laughs> it was really at this point that we uh, started to talk about how we were financial messes uh, and that we really could, shouldn't even be considering going up there for vacation. Uh, and so we get to our place we take our bags out of the car, open up the door, and we literally walk down a flight of stairs into a basement apartment, right? So this is where we were an hour and a half before having this fantasy conversation about buying land and building a house to realizing that we didn't even own our own home to vacation away from. Uh, and the crazy thing about this is at the time, John and I were both in financial services we had 13 years of combined experience helping other people understand how they should be saving for the future. And we had $51,000 in credit card debt. Was this your first conversation about money? Uh, yes. Well, that, 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 that started the first conversation about money. Up until then, because we were both in financial services, we thought like, okay, well, he can't be as bad as I am with money. And so I'll, I'll just trust him. And he thought the same thing about me. Um, and you know, the time, like we were like, just when we first got together, we were in that complete puppy love phase. So like we were just spending and having a lot of fun and taking days off of work and doing little trips, you know, into the mountains and we just weren't paying attention at all. Um, yeah. And we, we either had the cash or we could swipe the credit card and we both thought everybody, the other one was doing fine. I think that uh, we had had little tiny conversations uh, uh, around like when we decided to move in together, we talked about, you know, how much we but we never had any bigger picture conversations about where we were financially, where we stood financially. We just kind of, like John said, I think we were in this kind of whole puppy love and I don't want to scare him away with the fact that I had, I think at the time I had $17,000 in credit card debt. The rest so, was mine. <laughs> Yay, John wins. <laughs> but at that time we were just focused on the weekend, right? So we would, our, 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 we were just living the life and uh, our, our, we went to happy hours every Friday. Then we would, that happy hours would lead into dinners. Every night, Saturday night was dancing. So we needed a new outfit for every Saturday night to go clubbing. He did. I, I didn't. He did. <laughs> so, <laughs> some of the dumb mistakes that we made. <laughs> what? So what were, was was the bulk of this expense going out and these types of those types of expenditures, or was it? Uh, you know, was were there automobiles involved, or where did the bulk of that debt really come from? Yeah, that's a great question. So I was the big ticket spender. David was the nickel and dimer. So when I first moved to Colorado, I, um, you know, I moved there from Pennsylvania and I had $5,000 cash in my account uh, that my grandparents gave me for a graduation gift. And so within over a year, I was $25,000 in credit card debt. Um, but I had, because I had to decorate my new apartment, I had to get a new car, I needed brand new clothing. Um, I couldn't ride the same snowboard I did in Pennsylvania and Colorado. Um, so I had to, and of course the, the furniture and the decorations I bought for my first apartment was all Pottery Barn. I just thought I deserved all these things um, and I needed all these things to sort of validate who I was. So um, I couldn't, you know, couldn't be any less than what I thought was ideal or perfect. Otherwise I might not catch the, great, the right guy. <laughs> okay. So first of all, yes, you can use the same snowboard. Second, <laughs> I've learned <laughs> what's wrong with Pottery Barn. That's <laughs> high end. I shop at yeah. the thrift store. Right, right, right. Well, that's and I third. I like how you use the word deserve. Yes. I deserve it is probably the worst financial statement you can make. Yeah. Yeah. If you can't afford it, then no, you don't deserve it. Not at all. Exactly. You might I, I want it. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that uh, we have. Um, uh, traded out, deserve, and earned, right? I think that, uh, like you said, if you haven't, you don't, if you don't have the money or you haven't earned it, um, then you don't deserve it. But we just kind of have dropped that, that whole idea. And, and for me, 
I, like John said, I was a nickel and dimer. I was the person who literally almost every single day I stopped at a bagel shop and got coffee and a bagel for, before I went to work. Most days uh, I went out to lunch. So I was spending hundreds of dollars a month on dining out. And then as John and, John and I got together, it translated into that as well. Um, one of the other things that I think most people just drop their jaw when we say this, but when we cut back, we cut about $30,000 of food spending a year out of our budget. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. <laughs> what, because you know, the way that John and I used to grocery shop, we were, we were just, uh, I, I will be honest, we were stupid the way we used to grocery shop. Every day we would, on the way home from work, we worked near each other, so we carpooled. That was, I think that was the only way we saved money at that time, because we just were carpooling. But we would stop at Whole Foods and buy enough food for one meal. And you know that when you go to Whole Foods and you buy enough food for one meal, you're going to walk out and spend anywhere from 60 to $80, right? Well, we would do that like four days a week. And then on the weekends, we were dropping $100 on dinners on a regular basis. So we were just, everything was gourmet, everything was fancy. Like John said, we thought we deserved it. We had decent jobs and we were just spending way more money than we made. Right. This sounds like the waffles on Wednesday. They said that they were also spending uh, like $30,000 a year when they quit going out to the bar that was down the, down the street. <laughs> like they were paying the equivalent of an entire bartender salary. Right. Yeah. Well, that didn't even include our, our alcohol budget. That's a whole different line item. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we would go to work every day and we felt like, okay, well, I've got this college degree. I've got this job now. This must be what I do. I deserve this. And I worked all day long or I worked all week. Now I deserve this, this fancy dinner out. When I graduated and I moved out to Colorado, I thought, well, I graduated college. I deserve to live like an adult. No more, no more posters with sticky tack on your wall. Um, I just felt like, like I deserved all this. And I think people still have that expectation today. Um, you know, when you go into your friends and family's house and you kind of see how they're spending, you can kind of sometimes get a, get a sense, you know, you have an idea of what they might be earning. You don't always know, but you kind of have a sense. You kind of see the way that they're spending money. You kind of have to ask yourself, why are they spending that way? Most of us have attachments that we don't even necessarily realize that we have. Um, and trying to break those habits can be very difficult for a lot of people. What, what about uh, student loans or any other types of debt like that? Was that a factor at all um, in, your, in your lives? No. No. We were kind of right before that. Yeah. I, I, I didn't have any student loans. I was fortunate enough. Um, I was a late bloomer and I didn't go to college until I was 29. Um, so at the time I had a full-time job and fortunately uh, I had an employer that reimbursed tuition uh, and um, I also was working in financial services during the whole build up to dot com. So they were desperate to keep people. So they allowed me to work 32 hours a week and go to school full time and paid for my education. I, I was very fortunate about the time period that I, I went to school. Wow. Um, now, granted, I, I think that I think that uh, probably each year I maybe spent about anywhere from a thousand to two thousand dollars of my own money on on school. Um, but that was for things like books or a new computer or those kinds of things. But I was just very fortunate to not have to have acquired that. And maybe that was just a, I, that whether that was a fluke or maybe I was making a, a smart financial decision, I just didn't take on any student loan debt. Let's go ahead and call that a smart financial decision. A purposeful, <laughs> smart financial decision. You need a one yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> So you had $51,000 in just random whatever debt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, um, in the year and a half that we were together before we did that, um, I know that we took two trips to Miami that we put on credit cards uh, and we stayed uh, at um, a hotel that was literally on the beach. Uh, and we didn't spend a whole lot of time at the hotel. It was those kinds of mistakes that you know, we have to have different property. We have to be able to look out the window and see this amazing view. And then we left the hotel and didn't do anything. <laughs> right. So it was, it was walk, we would walk down to the beach. Um, it was the, just, the, the, I think that the, the, like John said, the divert, I deserve this lifestyle. Just, we just got so caught up in that. Yeah. I put a down payment on my car on my credit card of $5,000. So that was, that was a fair chunk of change. You can pay your car with a credit card. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, so if the car I was leasing too, by the way, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, finance it. I was leasing it. <sighs> okay. Great. Yeah, Just, are, 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 Scott, <laughs> do you have It was that a list? Honda Civic. It was a Honda Civic or Toyota Corolla, right? <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was the most- <laughs> Jetta. Jetta. Yeah. Equivalent. Close. Okay. okay, so we're checking all these boxes. No student loan, yet still $51,000 in random credit card debt, charging everything, charging a car, uh, which I didn't even know you could do. So I learned a new thing. Um, you're driving down from Winter Park, suddenly having this conversation that you should have had 18 months ago. What's the first thing you do? When you get back and you realize not only can we not afford an auxiliary apartment, we can't even afford like a rant, a regular house, like our primary residence. Exactly. Yeah. What? How did you start turning around your fine? Did you start? Are you like a thousand, a hundred thousand dollars in debt now? Or we cried a lot. <laughs> no. No, we oh wait, never... no, you're the debt free guys. Yeah, how did debt. you become the debt free guys <laughs> from fifty one thousand dollars in ridiculous debt? Yeah, yeah. I think the first thing we said was WTF. Uh, we sat on that basement floor for about six or seven hours, <laughs> cried miserably. Um, but we started to ask ourselves questions of, you know, we we made pretty decent money. We weren't, you know, we weren't rolling in the dough, but we made pretty decent money. And a lot of our friends were by, passing us uh, in terms of life goals. They were getting married and they were building houses or buying houses, um, and their lives were expanding. And ours continued to always seem like they were contracting. And so we just started to ask ourselves, like, what are we doing wrong here? In theory, we should know better what to do with our money. We're helping other people with their money. Why can't we help ourselves? Um, so we kind of did a lot of self-reflection over the next uh, two or three months. Um, and we kind of realized that we were not really spending according to either of our values. Uh, we were sort of, uh, for a number of reasons, we were living up to everyone else's expectations. Um, and we felt like we had to have certain kinds of approval um, from our parents as well as our community. We sort of felt like we had to um, maybe put on the appearance of being better than other people to make ourselves feel better um, and to also prove, hey, I might be gay, but I'm as good if not better than you. And so I think there was a lot of that. And it didn't take until maybe three or four months uh, after that, that experience for us to realize the way that we're spending is not at all in line with what we actually want. In hindsight, we realized we want to save for retirement, travel the world on cash, and give back to our community. If you look at our, 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 our savings and our checking account at the time, we were not spending at all that way. Hmm. Yeah, I think that between the two of us, um, even though both of us work with financial services and were smart uh, enough to have started 401ks, between the two of us, we had a negative net worth. So we had less in our less than $51,000 in our, our 401k so our, we had a negative net worth and we just it, John we, we did really say if we continue down this path where will we be a year from now and we knew if we a year from now we would still be in that basement apartment that's not where we wanted to live five years ten years we just knew our lives were going to continue to be mundane um, we might have a lot of eat a lot of nice food and take some nice vacations but that was it. Yeah. So what was your action plan that you, that came out of this? Like what, what changed behaviorally coming out of this conversation? Well, fortunately, David is a numbers nerd and he loves Excel. <laughs> so the, the first thing that he did uh, was one or two weekends after that, he went and itemized every single expense that he could of ours for the previous 12 months to figure out, okay, why are we, what, what is not in alignment with, align with what we can afford or what we should be spending our money on. Um, and that really uh, highlighted some, some major striking areas that we were completely messed up in. One of them was the, the, the food budget. One of them was our alcohol budget, which was about $10,000 a year. Um, and that allowed us to figure out, okay, what are we doing wrong? Where can we, where can we find some savings quickly? How can we rein in this, this spending as fast as possible? That was probably the first thing that we did. Yeah. The, the, uh, well, I think that, um, the, the, what we just mentioned earlier, I think having the conversation about what our life's go- what life goals were really kind of solidifying what it is that we wanted, that gave us the motivation then to say, how do we change it? So the first step, as John mentioned, was to do this crazy spending analysis. I literally, it took me like four hours and I looked at every single statement, every credit card, every checking account, savings account, everywhere we had money. And I started writing, I mean, if we spent 99 cents, I wrote it down. Uh, and I put this, put together this huge spreadsheet. 
And it really is eye-opening. When you do a spending analysis, most people just kind of wing it when it comes to their budget or what they're spending. And we decided not to do that anymore. Wow. Yeah. Tracking your spending. What a shocking yes. way to, you know, and if you're not tracking your spending, that first view of where your money goes is pretty, like painful. you said, eye-opening, painful. Yeah. Like, I'm doing what, what with my money? That's not where I want it to go. Well, then right. why is it going there? When you right. don't pay attention, it's so easy to just slip up. Right. Right. What you're actually doing and what you want to be doing are very often not aligned. And people are very surprised when they realize what they're actually doing. We, so now we, one, uh, this, our spending analysis is included in our credit card payoff course. Every time we have students go through that spending analysis, one, they hate the idea of having to go back for 12 months and look at their expenses. But when we finally encourage them to do that, then their eyes just like blaze over or they, they, their eyes pop out. They just they, they can't believe how they've been spending their money. And we've had several people tell us, like, I didn't know I spent that much money on alcohol. <laughs> that seems to be one of the most reoccurring high expenses that people that we, we work with have uh, experienced. So what, 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 uh, so once you saw that, what, what changed? Did you start shopping at grocery stores? Did you start drinking natu natural light? What, what was the kind of alcohol? Natural, light. <laughs> natural light. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Exactly. <laughs> Things never got wrong with that. that. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> I think that the, the, the first thing is would, because some of those categories were just so shocking to us, we immediately knew where we could make some tweaks to literally cut thousands of dollars a year out of our spending that could then be funneled towards paying off our debt. Um, we went from, from spending hundreds of dollars a week on groceries to spending between 75 and 100. Um, we created a menu and a grocery list every single week. We started shopping. We we started shopping like moms who have seven kids and, and don't have a lot of money. That's we had the envelope what, with the coupons inside, and if we didn't, if it wasn't on sale or we didn't have a coupon for it, we wouldn't buy the food. It wouldn't go on our menu that week. And, and the fortunate thing is now there's all sorts of tools and apps that can do that, help you do that. But back then we just had to do it all ourselves. But we found that that was that is what started to make sense for us. We started to cut back on our dining out. Um, our friends started, uh, when, when our friends would ask us, you know, to go out or do things, we started kind of deflecting to say, can we do, hey, do you guys want to do this instead? It's cheaper. Or we actually started, I would like to say we kind of became Julie Cruz directors of our friend group because we started, really started pushing, let's go to the museum on this free day. Let's go to the park and hang out there and have a bottle of wine instead of, Spending everybody dropping fifty dollars on brunch, you know those kinds of things were the, the, the John and I realized that we still loved uh, being social. We still wanted to have a fun life, and if we just cut everything out, we wouldn't continue. We wouldn't continue on our prog our path. We would just kind of lapse back into the spending and doing everything the same if we still weren't having fun. So it was how can we have fun, still do do the things that we love to do. Yeah, we stopped going out as much. Um, that was a, another big expense of ours, going clubbing and partying every weekend was a huge expense. We dialed that back considerably. We didn't eliminate it altogether, um, but we dialed it back. And then we figured out how to lower all of our credit card interest payments down to uh, 0%. And then um, that ended up actually being $10,000 as well. So we were able to, to lower that down to 0% per year. We had an extra $10,000 we could put a year towards our credit card debt. Awesome. So what, what did that look like in terms of dollar progress made in that first year against that debt? Well, we paid off our debt in two and a half years. Do you recall what right. we did in the first year? Um, I, I think that uh, the, I can't remember exactly, but I want to say we were closer to about $20,000 the first year uh, because it took us a little bit of time. We cut, up, cut about $20,000 the first year. It took us a little bit of time to really kind of ramp up to figuring out all the ways that we could really cut back and start saving money. Mm. Well, that's still very impressive. I mean, like $51,000 in two and a half years, basically from these two, two or three major categories of spending after yeah. isolating them and tracking them and making a couple of behavioral changes. That, yeah. That's fantastic progress. Yeah, we, we knew that we wanted to pay it off as fast as possible. And that's why when we looked at the snowball method to pay off our credit card debt and the avalanche method, they, all, they both make sense in their own way. But we realized, you know, it's just, just going to take so much longer with this high interest payments. Um, and we want to pay this off fast. We want to end this problem and, and move on with our lives. Um, which, that's what encouraged us to look a little bit deeper to figure out how we could pay it off faster. 
How did your friends react when they would say, hey, let's go to brunch and it's $50 a person. And you're like, how about we go to the park instead? <laughs> well, you know, so it, that was very interesting. We had some friends who are, you know, we, we kind of just evolved away from naturally. No, no, uh, no hard feelings at all. But we just kind of went in different directions. But it was surprising to us how many friends of ours um, either had credit card debt themselves or they just had some other life goal that they agreed would be much more easily achieved if they dialed back their spending as well. Whether it was, uh, we had at the time, we had a lot of friends who were trying to have children or they wanted to buy a house for the first time or they were uh, saving for a wedding. Um, and so if they could dial back their spending as well, um, um, those people engaged with us. Um, so I think for the most part, it was cool. We were very open with our situation too. And so people, I think, felt relieved because we were, we were probably the worst of everybody, so um, they could feel a little bit more open about their situation. <laughs> um, so it, it was interesting how, how it happened. But yeah, like I said, some people evolved away. Um, most people were pretty supportive and kind of got on board. Yeah. Did you tell them, hey, let's go someplace else because we're trying to pay off debt? Like, were you <laughs> open and honest with them? Because this is the conversation that yeah, nobody right. We were very specific. Um, well, you know, I, I don't think it was a surprise to anybody because we didn't have the nicest cars at the time and we were renting a basement apartment. Um, it's just, you know, and two, you know, middle-class white men typically would be doing better financially than living in a basement apartment. So I think, I don't think it was a surprise to anybody. Um, but yeah, they, they were kind of surprised when we did tell them a little bit. Yeah. I, th I think that the people that were surprised the most, um, was family because <laughs> we, we told them and, and we said, we're, we're like, for example, uh, the very first year, we told family and said, we're not going to exchange Christmas presents this year um, because we're trying to pay off debt and uh, we want to ch make some financial changes, which is interesting because that stuck and we still don't exchange Christmas <laughs> presents. Well, no, that's not entirely true. We, um, the kids get gifts until they graduate at whatever school they're going to finish going to school at. So whether it's high school or college, you can still get Christmas and birthday gifts. But after you graduate and you're done school all together, then, then no more gifts. You're an adult. So. <laughs> but we haven't stopped that tradition yet. <laughs> you know, going back uh, to something you said just a, a minute or two ago, you, you talked about how you had this debate about the debt snowball versus the avalanche method. Can you explain both of those, those terms and then how you settled on your debt pay down approach? Yeah, so um, the debt avalanche uh, is... Um, basically, where you you pick a uh, a small uh, card, the smallest card, you pay off that small card. Wait, I'm going to get balance card. Uh, yeah, smallest balance card first. And as you, basically, the idea is you continue to make your your minimum payments on all your cards, but you pay off as much as you can on that smallest card first. As you pay that off, then it starts to give you some momentum to continue paying. So you pay off one card and then you move to the, the next smallest balance, next card balance after that is the next one. So you're really kind of the idea is you're accumulating some speed at which you pay the, the cards off. That's the avalanche. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I, maybe yeah, I have them confused. Um, but that might be the snowball. That's, that's yeah, Dave Ramsey's uh, method, right? Yeah. Yeah. Snowball right. is Dave Ramsey's method. So yeah, that, uh, so then the other, the other method, the avalanche, I guess the snowball is smallest balance. Avalanche is the highest interest, and so you're you're going to basically again pay off the minimum balances or pay the minimum balances on all your cards, but you're going to focus on the card that has the highest interest rate and pay that off first. Um, so the when when we looked at both of those, um, we kind of looked at them and said, uh, well, we're still paying ten thousand dollars a year in interest if we keep our interest rates at the same amount. Why would we continue to waste ten thousand dollars a year? And that's when we said, we got to do our own thing. We got to figure that those are, those are, I think those are good, but we've got to do our own thing. So that's when we created what we call the debt lasso method. And that is the desire to get all of your debt in one location. We try to pull all of your debt into one location and get it at the lowest interest rate possible. For us, fortunately, that was the time period of, uh, it, when credit card companies were just flooding everybody with mailboxes with zero interest rate offers. So we got everything under zero interest rate offers. So we paid that $3 balance or 3% balance transfer fee. And we eliminated that $10,000 a year that we were paying. It, it, it then it ended up being $1,500 because we paid the 3% rather than paying 20% on the cards that we had. And that is what really expedited our process of paying off debt faster. Um, and that's, that's why. 
Sorry. That's really interesting because I have been hesitant to move like credit cards because of the 3% transfer fee. It used to be 0% transfer fee, which I right. like better. Um, right. And I'm sure you do too. But that is, you're st when you do the math, sometimes that works out. I like that idea. Then you're paying one number. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. So and we typically try to encourage people to get the longest terms possible. And as of a couple of months ago, there were still some terms out there for as long as 12 and 18 months. So the longer term you can get, the better, because then you're, you're going to have fewer transfer fees if you have any more than one. And then, but the, the idea is if you got a hundred percent focus on using every free dollar you have to pay off the credit card. Yeah. It, it, the other thing is I think if you have a, a very large amount of debt, like looking back, uh, if we had $51,000 of credit card debt today, may not even go for the zero balance transfers and may go for um, a low interest loan. Because if you have a significant amount, you're probably, no one is going to, would give us a credit line of a credit card of $51,000. They just wouldn't do it, right? So, um, but if you have, if you could get a loan from someone, let's say that was a four or 5% loan, well, then you're able to do that transfer once and then continue paying that down. Um, so you have that, you have, you only have that one, that one transfer fee. But if you have a smaller amount, then do the transfers and get them all into one credit card. Yeah. And, and it sounds like another piece of this too is that, you know, when you have that very low interest, that zero starter interest rate for 12, 18 months, whatever, you know, you guys aggressively paid off $51,000 in two and a half years, right? Um, that may not be practical for a lot of people with a similar amount of debt, right? It may take them a, a little bit longer of a time period. I mean, those are two quote unquote variable expenses that were crushing your expenses, right? In the, exactly. in the food and alcohol budgets, right? right? And so if you knock those out, you're able to pay off, it seems like a lot of debt coupled with refinancing your debt and right. putting it all on that credit card. Right. But if it's going to take you five years to pay it off, this is may not be the, the, the loan may be a more practical approach as well, because now you've got a fixed interest rate. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. You've paid off your debt and now you have a zero net worth. What's the next step? <laughs> Well, actually, we didn't have zero network. Right. Then. <laughs> the nice thing is, is as we were paying it off, we started to see it tip. You know, eventually what we had in our 401ks started to be more than our debt. And so we started to have a positive network. But the, the one of the cool things is that John and I really became very restrictive on our travel uh, while we were paying off our debt. But we timed the end of our paying off our credit card debt with when John's uh, friend got married. So we timed it so that we could save enough cash and go to Mexico for her wedding. Uh, so that was kind of our reward to ourselves. And then after that, it was this all out, let's build up our net worth. Let's buy a, uh, a home for ourselves. Let's get, get out of the basement. And so that's really kind of what we all of a sudden started doing is really started to accumulate. And that was just as much fun watching the, that go up, our net worth go up, as it was watching our debt go down. What what was your savings rate throughout this period on average? Was it was that rate as a percentage of your income climbing as over those two and a half years and into this area when you're building positive net worth? Sure. So the period of time when we were paying off our credit card debt, we had um, I think I stopped contributing contributing to my four hundred one k and all my retirement um, accounts altogether. I think you still contributed I, five percent. I maintained enough to continue to get my company match. Um, fortunately, my com the company I worked for then was uh, still um, matching at a very high rate. And uh, so I was trying to uh, get a, continue to get the company match. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was pretty low until then. And then after, after we paid off the debt, then we jumped that back up. And we probably, up until the point we, we both quit working for someone else, we were contributing anywhere from 15 to 20% of our, our, our income into our 401ks. Yeah, so when I think about savings rate, I, I think that paying down debt is can absolutely count for savings rate. That it's just anything that's uh, surplus yeah. over your the expenses to fund your lifestyle. And it right. sounds like you know if, if it's two and a half years, it, you know you, you put fifty one thousand dollars towards savings yeah. right over that time period. But that I think is like one of the critical concepts to going toward financial freedom and all these other things. Was right. that accelerating that percentage of your income that you put towards either debt or investments, even outside the four hundred one k? 
Uh, so one of the things that we did um, is that immediately out of the gate, we did uh, build up an emergency savings of $1,000. We both mm -hmm. contributed to that account because we knew that um, we wanted to get rid of our credit cards and stop using them. And we knew that we would keep them around if we didn't have that emergency savings. Um, and so that was our initial savings. Uh, and then it was everything going to, as much as possible, everything going towards our debt. Like you said, um, the, uh, the fact that we were paying off our credit cards um, was giving us, in my opinion, a 20% return every year for those, those, that two and a half years. Because had we not refinanced or had we not uh, uh, paid it down, we would have been paying interest on those. And so that was what I was looking at when, when I would see people saying that they were getting a 14% return off of their S&P 500 uh, index, I would be like, well, I'm getting 20% return off of my zero balance transfer card <laughs> and I'm paying it off. Yep. So I felt just as excited about that. The fact that, I, like you said, I was paying that we were paying it off um, because even though it's, it's just sitting there and you're watching the balance go down, um, like I say, it was just as exciting that seeing that balance go down as anyone else would be seeing their investments go up. Because our net, what I was really looking at is I was looking at our net worth number. And I looked at our net worth number every two, he still does. twice a month, first in the month and middle of the month when we pay ourselves or when we would get paid back then. And that's how I just was get, I would get so excited about seeing the progress. And there would be people who would um, talk about where well, the market was down. So my net worth was down. And I was like, well, mine went up because we paid off an extra thousand dollars on our credit cards this month or something like that. So what did you what did you do with your investment approach with the excess money after the debt was paid off? Did you and you know you, you mentioned that you put more money into the four hundred one ks. Was there any activity going on outside of that in terms of saving up for the house? Or well, yeah, we had so, saved up a down payment for the house. Yeah, we saved up a small small down payment for the house, but we also then um, we just all throughout that time period we kept on putting small amount of money into our emergency savings. And when we got to the point where our debt was paid off, we had over $5,000 uh, in our emergency savings because we just kept on putting more and more money into that. As we could pay, pay less on our debt or, or found other ways to save money, we kept on creeping that up because at the time, both John and I were both working for the same company in financial services. And uh, we started our debt-free journey in um, basically early 2006 was when we really started to, to take it start, started to pick up. Uh, and it was in 2008 when the market crashed and we were just both of us very worried that we were both working for a financial services company. If that company had a hiccup and fired, let people go and they did, we could both lose our jobs. And so that became, uh, we, it became very important for us to make sure that if we had to, we had enough money to fall back on so that we could immediately go get jobs somewhere like Starbucks or something like that so that we could at least cover our rent or a mortgage. Get free coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you built up an emergency savings of $1,000, which sounds like the Dave Ramsey baby steps. That's I think that's baby step number one. Did you follow the baby steps or did you just kind of wing it? No. No, we don't follow it, Dave Ramsey. Yeah. It, it, uh, and... Um, what was so interesting is I don't know why we did this, but John and I just went and did everything on our own. We're, we're, maybe we're, we're bad learners, <laughs> but we didn't look for someone else to tell us this is what you do. We just said, what is going to work for us? How is this going to work for us? We know what the foundational principles are of getting out of debt. Spend less than you make, put, my, put what you make, what, uh, the difference towards your debt, pay the debt off, and then start accumulating. And that was kind of the basically uh, the idea for us was stop using our, you know, in our book, Four Principles of a Debt-Free Life, that's what it is. Become money conscious, understand where your money is going. Um, then uh, we switched over to primarily being cash-based. We didn't use our credit cards or debit cards as much anymore. Uh, we had a plan. Uh, we created a, a payoff plan. Uh, and so we, we just this... That was our process. That's what we created. And then afterwards, we were like, oh, there's other people out there that are talking about this. It wasn't until we were debt free that we knew that there were like personal finance bloggers about money, that there are podcasts about money. And we just did it our own way. Yeah. Um, which so, I think, you know, we knew enough from, from financial services to be dangerous. So wait, wait, wait. You, you just um, dropped some 
amazing knowledge that I've never in my life heard before. Spend less than you make. What <laughs> what wizardry yeah. is this? Can you? I'm I'm just gonna make you say that again. And go slower so I can type it out so we can include it in the show notes, which for this show will be found at biggerpockets.com slash money show 76. So uh, tell me those again, spend less. <laughs> so spend less than you make. You know, one of the things I like to tell people is, um, or remind individuals is no one gets rich spending more money than they make. No, if you want to get rich, you have to figure out how to spend less money than you make. And you have to then have to put that money to work. But uh, uh, kind of the foundational ideas for us were uh, to become money conscious, uh, aware of where your money is coming in and going, uh, then uh, um, live by a budget or have, a, have that kind of structure around your, how your money is spent, switch to being cash-based, and then finally have a plan. And, and that plan is not just for paying off your debt, but your long-term plan. What do you want? Really, you really, what are your hopes and dreams? What do you want to like? And the idea of being money conscious is, um, in hindsight, we realized that was in uh, Think and Grow Rich, but we didn't actually come up with it from, from reading his book. Um, we came up with that on our own as well. Uh, and, and people think it's a very elusive description, but for David and me, we were just spending left and right without paying attention to any of our finances. And you know, over the last couple of years, we didn't think that we had some friends and family who were paying attention to what we've been doing with our business, but they've started to come out of the woodwork and say, because we don't ever shut up about money, uh, they've just started to make slightly better financial decisions in their day-to-day -day lives because they're just kind of slightly aware when they're at the grocery store, like, do I need this kind of soap or this kind of soap? They buy, you know, and those kind of better financial decisions are starting to accumulate into great financial results for them. So it's that, just a little That has happened in my life too. And that's so rewarding when you see somebody who is like, like just so spendy on dumb stuff. And you're like, I know why you're always broke. <laughs> and then you never shut up about money. Scott, anybody in your life that is like, wow, you never shut up about money and now I'm better before because of it. You, you know, I think I was more annoying about it. If, not annoying, annoying. I was, I was annoying everybody about it. I, I was not a good, uh, I didn't do it probably as tactfully as you guys are doing <laughs> with, <laughs> based on what you're saying here. So I was kind of like, why aren't you doing this? This is obviously correct. And nobody likes being told how to live their lives by <laughs> 20 year old Scott Trench. So that, that, that was, uh, I think now I'm, I'm more, Hey, if someone's interested, I'll, I'll tell them and chat about it and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, <laughs> well, I apologize if I have given the, the impression that I am doing it tactfully. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I think that we've had some people roll their eyes and turn around and walk away from conversations because of things we've said about how they spend as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, John and I, uh, we, Today, we focus on trying to help the LGBT community, but we see it so prevalent in our community, you know, that you're not a good gay if you don't have $40 shampoo. Yeah. If you don't care about your hair, you spend on what's important and you save on money that or you save on things that don't matter. Right. So and that's what it comes down to. to. And, and, you know, I think, Mindy, that's the biggest, one of the biggest points I think a lot of people don't understand or think about is actually sitting down and saying, what is important to me? Is, is what's most important to you having a caramel macchiato for breakfast every single morning? If that's really important for you, then go ahead, spend $1,800 a year on Starbucks. Do it, if that really, but John and I have found that when it comes to most things, when we sit down and think about it, we're like, that's not that important to us. Um, what's important to us is and we we already we've already said is those three things we want to save for retirement, we want to give back to our community, and we love to travel. Our favorite question is: Do we want to have that margarita here in Pennsylvania, or do we want to have it in Puerto Vallarta? Every single time, it's in Puerto Vallarta. <laughs> Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to ask you guys about was after kind of paying down the debt. What what year was that, by the way? What year did you pay off the debt in? It uh, middle of two thousand eight. Middle of 2008. Okay. And so from there, it seems like that's where this kind of journey towards financial freedom began in earnest following that. How did you go about setting that up? And I know that there's probably a combination of investment and business income involved in that journey. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So that's a hodgepodge of stuff that happened. So after we paid off our debt, we thought we would be really brilliant and 
uh, publish a book about how we paid off our debt and help other people. But nobody wanted to buy our book because nobody knew who we were. And fortunately, a, a, a publisher said to us, you know, because you have no platform, you should create a platform and then publish your book. And we thought that the book was the platform. Uh, and then we're like, okay, well, how do you create a platform? Um, and we realized, oh, okay, there are people out there who do personal finance blogging, David. You should check this out. Maybe <laughs> we could do that too. And so we started a website called Debt Free Principles. Um, and then that evolved into Debt Free Guys. Um, and we, at the time, I don't think it was really necessarily anything we wanted to turn into a business. Uh, it started out more of a hobby. I just wanted to have fun with it. And then we realized that, oh, my God, there are people making money doing this, helping other people. You could probably do the same thing too. And it was about that time that we thought to ourselves, we were tired of going to work every single day. Uh, he would drop me off at work and then he would come back and pick me up and we'd go home. We'd have like three or four hours where we could eat dinner, hang out a little bit, watch some TV and go to bed. And I'm like, this isn't the life we want. We don't ever, ever actually get to spend time with each other. I'm sitting in a beige cubicle most of my life. Um, so we thought, well, could we figure out a way to, to monetize this, expand it? Uh, make it grow, and then also quit our day job so we could work full-time together. So it was, a, it was a combination of growing Debt Free Guys and eventually the Queer Money podcast, as well as the time that we were working for someone else, sucking as much money away as possible um, into our 401ks uh, that allowed us to be able to kind of branch off and, and work for ourselves. Got it. And, and you know, when, when it comes to the, the transition point, because you guys have, have now transitioned away from those those jobs, right? Mm -hmm. What did that look like? What, was it, what was your financial position at the point where you kind of began moving away from that full-time work? There was a lot of white knuckling. Tables. Are we going to do this? <laughs> so uh, I think that um, uh, the first time it happened um, really was kind of, uh, it was almost like the universe was saying, hey, you guys said that this is what you want to do. You need to do it or just stop talking about it. Uh, it was interesting, John had, uh, had gotten a new position at his job, uh, had been in that position for about a year and a half, and he would come home from work every single day, and he hated it. I mean, hated it. Hated his job, hated his boss. Um, his boss- Strongly disliked. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, his boss was- Was it your favorite? Yeah. <laughs> His, his boss would talk out of two different sides of, uh, of their mouth, um, say one thing to uh, John in, uh, in private and then say a completely different thing about John when she did his reviews or she talked to him. Uh, and uh, it just became, uh, th there were times on Saturday where I couldn't even get him out of bed with bacon. Uh, because he was just so <laughs> tired and depressed. He was spending all of his energy and I was I just looked at him and I said, we have, we've built up this emergency savings. We have enough money in our retirement accounts right now that we're doing okay. We fortunately bought a condo that was one and a half times our annual salary. So we were not house poor. And so everything that I looked at everything and I said, I'm making enough money to support us. If we go back to living the lifestyle while we, when we paid off our debt, while we were paying off our debt, we can easily cover all of our expenses. If this is, if this is that bad, then you need to quit your job. And he did. He quit his job and uh, had nine months where he didn't have a job. And that's where we kind of reengaged and fell in love with this idea of helping other people do what we did and help them understand that there's so much more to life than going in to your job nine to five and just so that you can have the things uh that's the things aren't the enjoyable part of life it's actually enjoying life and what you can do with things and the time that you have and the money that you have that's really what is brings a lot of fun to life and we were not having fun especially because of his situation yeah and when when you've got a job that you hate it just consumes every bit of you because whenever you're not there, you're thinking, oh, only 17 more hours and I have to be back. Only five more hours and I have to go back in. Right. You know, Saturday is great because you're not at work, but then Sunday, all of Sunday sucks because you're like, oh, I got to go back to work tomorrow. Right. I got to squeeze every last ounce of joy out of today. And it's really <laughs> difficult. I work there too. And yeah. it's really difficult to, you know, have this job. You're like, 40 hours of my life is spent here yeah. and that's 40 hours every week that I just hate. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, 
like this idea that financial independence is all about quitting your job. Because if you don't have a plan for after you have quit, you're just pushing your problems down the road. If you're miserable now because of your job and you have other things enjoyable in your life, then when you quit your job, you can do more enjoyable things. But if all you do is work and you hate that and there's nothing else outside of it, then you're just going to sit there and hate your life afterwards. Right. So you, think, but you had a plan. Yeah, yeah, we did. Well, we, well, yeah, we had the, the financial security. It wasn't necessarily, we didn't strategize to be able to, for us, for me to quit at that time. But luckily we had the financial security. We didn't have the, the debt um, where we could take a little bit of, of a gamble. And the idea was that if I was going to be quitting to focus on growing debt for guys, that was my full-time job. I wasn't going to be spending the, the you know, afternoons at the pool or going out shopping with my friends. It was full-time work mode. So I went from working, you know, 60 hours a week for someone else to working 60 plus hours a week uh, for ourselves to get debt for guys growing. But you liked your boss. Yeah. And that's when we met you. (laughs) So what what year was that, by the way? Let's start with that. Uh, That was right after Alaska. It was 2013 uh, was when that happened. Um, He did... He did go back to working full time uh, about nine months later. And part of it was both of us realized we need to bank some more money in order for us to both be able to do this full time. And so he went back to work uh, for two years. We set a goal. Um, We didn't quite meet that goal. Uh, We originally wanted him to only work for a year. Uh, But then he was able to quit his job two years later. Uh, and part of that was because we started to see some revenue coming in from uh, what we were doing. And so that's when it started to make sense that, okay, he can quit his job and that can be another, that can be the revenue source uh, for us. Okay. So this sounds really interesting. This sounds like the, this sounds like the point where you're like, okay, we're, we're really going to retire early or at least leave full-time work very early. This is, this seems like a turning point in the thinking, right? Right. Yeah. What, you know, what changed? Oh, oh sorry. No, I was just going to say, it, it, what's interesting is that um, John and I never really considered ourselves part of the FIRE community, the mm-hmm. financial independence retire early. And I think that's because I got stuck on this idea yeah. that I still believed in traditional retirement. You know, retirement is when you don't work anymore. You don't work for anybody. You don't work for yourself. You're, you're, you're just done. Uh, and I've, I actually started saying it's to us, it wasn't uh, finan- uh, financial independence retire early. It was financial independence retire entrepreneur, and that's really kind of what mm-hmm. I, I was like. I'm not. I'm not going to. Re- I'm when I'm retiring. What I'm retiring is being chained to someone else's desk. Uh, I'm going to be chained to my own desk, <laughs> and that's when it really <laughs> we kind of we were like. <laughs> it, it made so much sense to us, and we started having all these conversations around. This is our new goal. This is our new, our new desire. Our new want is to get out there and help uh, our community start paying attention to their money. And so that's the, then uh, after two years, he quit his job. I continued to work for another two years and then I quit my job. And that was a year ago. Okay. So w- when you made this revelation for retire entrepreneur, I love that term. That's a, what a great spin on fire, right? Yeah. What <laughs> trademark that? <laughs> what changed about your asset accumulation approach? Were you still maxing out your 401k or were you doing things outside of that in order to facilitate this transition? Yeah. So uh, when I stopped working, I stopped contributing to my 401k. Um, the goal uh, was for me to contribute to my Roth. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have a, we, we we decided that we didn't have enough money for me to do that, and so much of the revenue that we earned initially was going into back into the business. Mm-hmm. David was supposed to quit a year after I did uh, the, the second time, um, but we weren't able to do that because healthcare was more expensive than we had originally budgeted for. So that's mm-hmm. why he ended up having to work an additional year. All the while, he was uh, still trying to uh, put as much into his four hundred one k as possible. Um, and then after he quit, um, he hasn't been able to obviously contribute to his 401k. We're now at a point where we're now uh, making it to enough money that we're able to contribute to, um, what did I have? Contribute to a SEPs or a Roths? Uh, Roths right now. Okay. So we're contributing to our Roths right now. Mm-hmm. It, the other thing is that John and I took a, a 360 look at our lives and said, what is it that we need to do or what do we want to do to be able to do this? And uh, I mentioned earlier that we had purchased a condo that was uh, one and a half times our salary. And we started looking at that as um, maybe there's an opportunity here for us to 
uh, to not have that anymore, uh, to unload that. And so we decided to do that. Uh, and so then um, when I, I quit my job after we had unloaded our condo. So we really kind of established, um, we had our retirement, then we had our emergency savings, and then we have this hoard of cash from the sale of our condo that is all there as ways for us to support ourselves over the next couple of years. We don't have a desire to spend that hoard of cash down. It's not, that's not what's happening, but we're, we have it there as kind of a secondary cushion for us continuing to grow our business. Love it. And, and this, and by the way, I think that's a, I don't think that's a bad move to sell the condo in that situation. I think it's a brilliant move. You have a clear plan in place at this point. You know exactly what you want and how you want to back into what your life's going to look like. And you make a decision that rounds that out. What you've built at this point, it sounds like, is a classic and fantastic position from which to pursue entrepreneurship or an, the next big opportunity, right? Mound of cash, significant yep. 401k reserves. It's almost like you've like, Hey, we, we hit, we hit a goal or whatever we think we're going to need to back into long-term for our 401k. It will compound into that. And now my, my cash position will support this business endeavor. And I know what my, I am very confident in my, um, spending, it sounds like, uh, on an annual basis. So you kind of know what that's going to look like and where you have room if things go poorly or where you can cut back if things, where you have room if things go well or where you can cut back if things go poorly. And right. I mean, that's, I mean, it sounds like this is, this is what a plan sounds like. This is what a plan that's been executed and is moving you along right towards that goal. Sounds Gosh, like you make me feel good about myself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's awesome. But, but like this, the like therapy it, session. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. I love it. <laughs> well, and uh, you're right that, um, that we have, uh, we have backed into a couple of things uh, with our retirement. We, one of the things we like to say to some individuals who we talk to is like, we don't have a long-term financial problem. We have a short-term financial problem. And that is tr tr trying to generate enough money for us to live day to day. We saved up enough money in our, in our retirements so that um, we set a specific number and we said that if, if the market can continue to give us 7%, 20 years from now, we will have that number when we plan on actually literally retiring and just spending all of our time at the beach. So <laughs> all of our time. <laughs> <laughs> and your worst case scenario, it sounds like, is one of you goes back to work if things don't work out, right? Yeah, yes. that's always that's always an option. Um, yes, yeah. yes. My favorite quote is, "What's the worst that can happen? You have to go back and get a job." Your right. worst case scenario is everybody else's everyday life. Yeah, and that's from <laughs> that's not mine. That's from Joel from FI One Hundred and Eighty. He was back on episode eleven of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast. Um, but that quote comes up so many times. Like people ask, one of the biggest questions is, "What if you run out of money?" Well, then I go back and get a job. Right. I have lowered my spending. So it doesn't really matter what kind of job I have since I live on such small amounts of uh, expense. Anyway, I can go work at Starbucks. I can go work at McDonald's. I can go work at Costco where they have health insurance and it's a great place to work. And you know, you don't have to have this corporate job to fund a life when you're not spending, you know, when you spend $75,000 a year, you need to make at least $75,000 a year more with taxes and all of that. But, right. you know, when you're spending $24,000 a year, it's really easy to cover that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Our overhead is pretty low. So especially now that we don't have a mortgage or rent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't have a mortgage anymore. You just live on the streets. Yes. Yeah. We, yes. we have a very nice box, cardboard yes. box. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Financial independence, retire uh, under a bridge. Under a bridge. <laughs> Frib. Yeah, that's way better than fire. So, so where do you guys live for real? Uh, temporarily, we're living in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, we were uh, recently the previous four months. We were uh, house sitting, uh, as people do in our community. They they house and cat sit, and so we were uh, we house sat for four months. Um, and after that, we moved down to um, friends of ours who uh, live in Westchester. They're going; they're leaving for Monaco in a few weeks, um, and they asked us to house sit for them. And uh, since we kind of didn't have any place to go in the interim, they said, we'll come down and hang out here um, until we go off and, uh, to the other country. And then um, at that point, we will be going to my sister's for a little while to 
help them out for a few months, and then we're going to return back to Spain for three months for David's birthday. <laughs> oh, well, what a horrible life you lead. <laughs> three months David in Spain. Spain. There for my birthday last year. He wants to go there for his birthday this year. <laughs> I, I, um, I will say that well, John and I are very fortunate to have uh, some great allies in our lives right now uh, because we are dedicating a, uh, a lot of our time and energy to helping the LGBT community with uh, improving their financial situation. And because of that, we want to try to focus on an area where there's a large population or there are large populations of individuals that we can re reach out to or actually meet face to face. And so we're doing that on the East Coast. And that's how um, uh, we just happen to be living where we're living because we have somebody who truly believes in what we're doing. Although the, the, uh, these two are not um, members of our community. They believe that helping our community is important because they see some, they've seen some financial struggles in our community. That's great. So I was on the about section of your website recently, and I really like what it has to say. If all this talk of money makes you feel inadequate, buried with debt, fearful of checking your credit score, then you're in the right spot because we felt the exact same. And a couple of weeks ago, we interviewed Ramit Sethi, and we he said when he asked people what they felt about money, they said the same thing. Money makes me feel stupid. Money makes me feel anxious. Money makes me feel guilty. Why are so many people afraid to talk about money? I think our society ties a lot of our, 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 our self-worth to our net worth. And a lot of people, I think, aren't doing well financially, or at least not manage their money appropriately. They might be... They might have a great income. We know of several people that we work with who are earning six plus figures, but it's going out as fast as it's coming in. Um, so I think it, they, we tie a lot of emotion to that. We don't feel confident. We don't, I think oftentimes it, it shows a part of ourselves that we don't want to share with other people. I also would say that uh, there's um, a lot of people feel uh, guilty that they're not doing as well as everybody thinks that they are. You know, they don't want to tell the truth. Um, we just, we, it, we, it's so easy to have the appearance that I'm doing really, really well. And everybody does that. And so when you start to uncover or dig into the truth about where you're at, it starts to bring up those feelings of, uh, uh, of shame, of guilt, of, you know, uh, you think about uh, just the traditional way of so the way that society has been built around the idea that Men are supposed to go out and earn enough money to take care of their families. Well, if you're a husband and you've got a wife and a couple of kids and your family is broke, you feel like you have failed your family. You feel like you have failed your parents, uh, everyone around you. If you're a mother and your family does not have uh, enough money, you may feel like you're not a wise uh, a steward of your family's finances. So both parties can feel so guilty and that guilt just gets transferred down to children because of the way that we carry that kind of baggage with us emotionally, the way we talk about money, you know, and uh, one of the things I think is so interesting is in our society, so many people deflect that away by saying money is bad. I don't have to be good with my money because if I'm not good with money, my money, I'm not rich and rich people are bad. So if rich people are bad and I don't have any money, I must be good. Well, that's just a load of crap, right? The more, if you're a good person, you can do good in the world if you have more money. You can do more good in the world if you have more money. And that's what I think that a lot of people get stuck on this idea is I don't want to be like this person or that person that is always in the news about how bad they are because they're rich. And that's, I think that's a struggle that many people have. We have, on one side, we have this shame and guilt around who, how we deal with our money. We have this negative viewpoints about how rich people are, but everybody out there fantasizes about what they would do if they won the lottery or had a great job or were making a, as much money as the Kardashians. They all know what they would do, but they, we, don't, we just don't do what's necessary to make it happen. Well, and winning the lottery is not the answer to your questions. If you can't figure out your your thirty thousand dollars, having a yeah. hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand dollars isn't going to change. You know, That's you don't right. suddenly become magically good with money just because you have more of it. You just right. spend more. Well, and I think seventy eight percent of people who win the lottery end up broke, which is about the same percentage of people who um, retire from the NFL end up broke because they get all this money, but they don't actually know how to to manage it. 
Yeah, within think, like three or five years afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be the panacea to all their problems, but it's not. Um, unless you are able, and that's what David and I learned was until we realized what was most important to us, it wasn't having $500 pairs of jeans. It wasn't having all these vacations that we couldn't afford. It wasn't drinking fabulous wine that we couldn't afford. It was that we wanted to, 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 to retire, travel comfortably, and give back to our community. We were so confused with what everybody else wanted for us or what we thought everybody else wanted for us, or we were so lost in validating ourselves to people um, because we all already felt valueless um, that we kind of exceeded all of our uh, expenses. Okay, John and David, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate your time today, but we're not quite done yet. Is there anything else you want to tell us before we move over to the famous four? I think the the last thing I would add is no matter where you are in your financial life, no matter how bad you might think that it is, um, you can improve things. There is the opportunity. It is not so bad that you can't fix it. Just look for the resources that are out there to help you, whether that's Bigger Pockets, the Debt Free Guys, or whoever you, you connect with. Find the tools and resources and people that can help you out and you can definitely get to where you want to go. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can't guess I don't that. have much to say after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's great about today, though, is that there's so many different people and resources out there that are exactly or that are extremely relatable to you, whatever your position is. I mean, what this is this is show number 76 of the Bigger Pockets Money Show, right? We've had 76 totally different perspectives come on today, all starting from completely different perspective, oh, different situations, perspectives, part, like places in life, all that kind of stuff. And that's what's, I think, really great about today's world. Yeah. There's a wealth of information out there if you look for it. Right. And you may have to pull from a couple, right? You may like what one person says on one particular topic, but uh, may resonate with someone else on something else. So don't, don't silo yourself into just having it come from one person. And don't feel like if that person isn't exactly like me, I can't listen to them. Just because someone may have a different belief system than you doesn't mean that what they're saying isn't valuable. They can have some value. Love it. Wow. Okay. Well, I knew I asked you guys on the show for a reason. <laughs> Okay, it is now time for the famous four questions. These are the same four questions and one command that we ask of all of our guests. Are you ready? Ready. I think so. <laughs> what is your favorite finance book? Okay. Well, uh, uh, just for simplicity's sake, I love the, the lesson that it teaches. Uh, I love The Richest Man in Babylon. I mean, that's a book that you can read with your kids that you can read on your own and it just all makes sense. It's just, it's so simple. I love that book. And it was written a hundred years ago. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's still 100% valid. Yes. I mean, I don't invest with the guy that buys rubies or whatever, but you know, <laughs> it's still all the lessons in there are 100%. That's my favorite finance book. I love that book. I also, it's written in like Shakespearean English, so it's not uh, necessarily you know, something that everybody will connect with, but I really love that type of language. So it was very, very fun to read. Yeah. And to be honest, I think that's where I got this whole idea of that no one ever gets rich spending more money than they make because his whole philosophy was make sure you're saving 10% of your money, right? You have to save something in order to get rich. John? <laughs> Me? Um, I would say Think and Grow Rich for David and me was very powerful. Um, whether or not you believe in the law of attraction and how all that works is one thing, but one of the biggest challenges that we had to, to, to compensate for was just our, our, our mentality and how we looked and uh, executed on things. Our biggest challenges were ourselves. Um, so we, that kind of book kind of helped us kind of reflect inward and sort of uh, start to redefine how we saw ourselves and what, what our opportunities we had ahead of us. I'll just add that there's so much in that book that is prescriptive. Um, you know, sometimes we read stuff and we just think, oh, I don't know how to do this. There are so many, this is how you do this steps in that book that are great to how, when, whether it's actually taking steps to, to make progress or it's actually, this is how you stop thinking that way or start thinking this way. Is everybody else dancing to that song too? This is how we do it. <laughs> this is how we do it. Yes, I've got that going on in my head. Thank you so much for that. All day long. You're welcome. Now, we, we probably already covered this at the second question in the Famous Four, but what was your biggest money mistake? Is there one that you can point to? Oh, yeah. I, biggest is hard. I, I have one. Um, 
it goes back to when I first uh, started with credit card debt. Uh, so when, um, when I was 19, my, uh, what, actually when I was younger, my family lived in Ireland for a short time period. And when I was 19, my parents and I um, saved up enough money so that I could go over to Ireland and see friends over there for a couple of weeks. My mother took me to the credit union and signed me up or co-signed on a credit card for me in case I had any emergencies, right? So she wanted to make sure that if I needed to, I could get a plane and get home. So uh, went to Ireland, came back, had $500 on the balance of the credit card and no emergencies, never saw the inside of a hospital or a police car, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> but um, that was when my albatross of credit card debt began. This whole idea that I, I could just spend somebody else's money and then pay it back later. And it, I kept it for 17 years. And I look back on it and over the years, I would say that probably over the 17 years, I probably have spent anywhere from I would say thirty to forty thousand dollars in interest payments, and I just think if I hadn't been able to invest that money, I would be a millionaire today, right? But instead, I got stuck. So my biggest mistake was not understanding how spending on credit cards anchors your future earnings to the past. Now, that's a very, very powerful way of putting that. I think. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, we need to teach money management to our children. We also need to teach it in schools. Like it's not the teacher's responsibility to teach my kids about money. Right. But so many parents don't know anything about money that we need to have, like it needs to be, they, kids need to be hearing it from everywhere. I mean, you, you can't right. just say, go out into the world and good luck. Like, you right. have to teach them how to be responsible with money. And, you know, it isn't something that's just, inherent. It isn't something that you're just going to be born with one day. You know, right. you learn that. Well, you know, it's, it's so interesting is we teach our kids that being rich is cool. We teach our kids that going to college and getting a good education is cool. We never teach them that the way that you do all that and do it right is actually cool. You know, it's all that all of that we say, oh, that's oh, that's mundane or that's boring or I hate this or I hate that. Well, of course, our kids aren't going to know how to do anything financially when they grow up because we have we've been telling them all along that we hate this this is boring i hate this this is awful it, it makes me feel bad well then that's, that's the way it exactly what is your best piece of advice for people who are just starting out dave and i would always go back to figuring out what what is most important to you what are your hopes and dreams um, and I think that's a great way to actually start a conversation with somebody who's maybe you're maybe in a relationship or newer in a relationship with. Um, you can start to focus on the big things that you want to achieve in life, what your what your hopes and dreams are, and then kind of dial back from there. Okay, how exactly are we going to achieve that? What's kind of preventing us from getting there today, or what what steps we have to implement to actually get to those those long term goals? But once you know, as David alluded to earlier, once you know exactly what's most important to you, then regardless of whatever situation you're in today, that can be your inspiration to get to where you want to go. So as you're living in a basement, chipping away at $51,000 worth of credit card debt, knowing that two and a half years you're going to be sitting on a beach in Mexico drinking a Mai Tai, that you hang on to that, it will happen. Love it. Yeah. I mean, you begin with the end in mind and you back into exactly the position that you want to be in, which is what you guys have done to outstanding effect Mr. here. Stephen Covey. Yeah. Okay. The hardest question. Yeah. What is your favorite joke to tell at parties? Oh, I know this is giving this us is a lot a of anxiety. <laughs> Neither of us are joke tellers. <laughs> no, I don't. I know, know a joke, but it's too colorful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I one. will. I will save you. How many people don't ask? Don't answer this question. Zero. Oh. I mean, I guess until show seventy six. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have had people who are not joke tellers. Um, so I will save you. Okay. With a horrible joke. <laughs> I went to the zoo and I saw a baguette in the cage. The zookeeper said it was bred in captivity. 
<laughs> oh man! But um, that was great. <laughs> no, it wasn't. No, we yes, it, was. it was awful. <laughs> For the record, I got that off of the internet. I did not make that up myself. <laughs> My kids have been telling me a bunch of really terrible jokes lately. I should write them down. <laughs> yeah, Actually, was, Claire's really good at jokes. Yeah. Last night, John and I were at a restaurant with uh, with Two Cup House, uh, Claudia and Garrett, and. For some reason, a, a gentleman just felt like he needed to sit there and tell us a whole bunch of jokes. <laughs> like, <laughs> Rattle them off. Because <laughs> right. like, well, he, he knew you were going to be on the show. Yeah. Yeah. And we, I know, we should have. We, well, we there was actually that. one that he told us. I was like, ooh, that's a very inappropriate joke to be telling a complete stranger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know Zena Kumak. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> call her up and ask her what jokes she told on the, on the show. Oh okay. yeah, that was terrible. We had to edit it out. I had to edit it out. Like I couldn't even let that be on the show. It was horrible. So yeah, anybody who wants to call Zena and ask her uh, what joke she told, she will be happy to tell you. Uh, just, I warned you. Uh, okay, and the command. Tell me where people can find out more about you. Oh, please. okay. Well, we're Dead Free Guys everywhere. DeadFreeGuys.com, Dead Free Guys on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, what else is there? Pinterest? Pinterest. <laughs> and we also have the Queer Money Podcast. Which, and that can be found on all podcast apps? Except uh, Spotify. No, We're getting yet. it over there to Spotify soon. But David's working, working on, on that. that one. But yes, uh, everywhere, so else right now. everywhere else you can find it. Okay, great. Well, David and John from The Debt Free Guys, this has been a super awesome show. I'm so glad we finally were able to connect and get you on. Thank you Thank for having you. us. Yes. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you, guys. And we will talk to you soon. All right. That was David and John from The Debt Free Guys. Mindy, what'd you think? I love their story. I love how once they truly sat down and thought about what they wanted their lives to look like, it had no bearing on what they were actually spending their money on. So they stopped. They took a good hard look at their spending. They changed it to reflect their values. And now they're leading the life that they truly want. They have the option. They had the option to quit their job. So they took it. And now they are taking what they love and teaching other people. Yeah. And, and you know, something that they said at the end really stuck with me there where, you know, there is this kind of stigma, it seems like in America today against people who are well off financially right? There is. And like everybody wants to be rich, but nobody wants to be rich. Mm -hmm. I can see the dislike for somebody who seems to be making money at, a, at the expense of somebody else. But we're here on this podcast because we believe that if you spend less than you earn and you invest it intelligently and you create passive income, a sizable cash cushion, all of the pillars of you know, financial independence that we've talked about over and over and over again in the show, that you're going to have the option for a better life to be more impactful and all that kind of stuff. And I don't think that comes at the expense of the rest of society in any way. And I don't think, I don't understand why there would be a stigma against somebody who became rich doing what we're talking about every day on our podcast. We're also coming from that though, from a position of not being poor. But we've, we've, we've heard so many people who have come from a position of being poor on this podcast, right? Yeah. And, and uh, we've gone from poor to rich and made that, made that transition, right? And it's no secret. It's the same way that everybody else has done it, right? Spend less than you earn and invest it. Wisely. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's a difference between having enough money to fund your lifestyle and having so much money that you don't know what to do with. And when you say rich, what do you think of? When I, when I say rich, I think of someone who's, yeah, I look, we, we're not supposed to put numbers on there. We asked this question uh, <laughs> another week with Ramit Sethi, right? And, you know, rich to me, I think means financial independence, right? Where your assets produce enough passive income such that you are reasonably likely to generate spendable liquidity in excess of your lifestyle needs, right? So that, I mean, that, what is that? It's a million dollars if you're trying to spend $40,000 a year after taxes, right? Or, 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 or on your lifestyle. So, right. But is spending $40,000 a year a rich person? 
you know, it, it, it all depends, right? You can live a multi, a hundred thousand, hundred twenty thousand dollar lifestyle on forty thousand dollars a year if your house is paid off, if your cars are paid off, right? If you own that stuff, that goes kinds of things free and clear. If you travel hack, there's no, there's ways to kind of back around that. So you can live a very fancy lifestyle on a very lo- low amount of money, depending on how you set things up and what you back into and what your plan is. True, but if you ask somebody what you know, what does a rich person spend? They're not going to say, oh, $40,000 a year. Yeah. That's not what rich people spend. That rich is exactly spend. what rich people spend. <laughs> that's the entire thing that we're trying to drill into everybody's heads here on this podcast. <laughs> that rich is what people rich people spend, spend less than they earn. <laughs> <laughs> people who are broke spend, make $200,000 a year and spend $200,000 a year, right? Yes. Yes, you do really do need to reframe the way you think about money if you are going to become financially independent. Yep. And that's what we're here for. And Love that's it. what that debt-free guys shared with us today. Love it. Should we get out of here, Mindy? We should get out of here today, Scott. From episode 76 of the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, this is Mr. Scott Trench, and I am Mindy Jensen, and we are gone. Mm-hmm.